Well, Tony, thanks for thanks for hosting us today. So the last time last time we were together, I wasn't planning on telling the story, but it probably wasn't unusual for you. So we we I texted you and you I, I knew you were staying down at Tillman's Tillman's place mm -hmm. at Post Oak and they tell me, hey, I'm gonna be around. You, you wanna grab some drinks? Yeah, let's grab some drinks. So we meet up at, at Tillman's place and uh, it, I think it was like a two days or three days before Christmas. It was like right around Christmas time. Yeah. And uh, you jump out. You jump out of the. Uh, I think you're, in, you're driving your Rolls Royce that day, and and we had some packages there, and you ran them up to this room, and came back down, and and I'm sitting there, and this guy comes up, and uh, th this just kind of gives the viewers a, a, a context of the of the intricacies of, of what it's like to be Tony Buzz. <laughs> this guy comes up. I think he was a tech executive of some sort. Very very sharp guy. Very very nice guy, and he said, Hey Tony, I just dropped a gift off for you at, at the at the front desk. And, uh, and he was wearing a uh, diamond bezeled watch. I, I forgot Piaget or I forgot what it was. And you, and you were too. And he made, there was some sort of comment in there that inferred that maybe he had bought you a diamond and bezeled watch for, for, uh, for, for Christmas one year or something like that. And there was some talk about a silver hammer or sil <laughs> some, sort, some sort of device like that. And so, and so we had a nice conversation. He leaves. About 20 minutes later, the bellman the bellhops come up and said, Mr. Busby, we have more presents that were delivered for you. Do you want us to take them up to the suite with the others? Uh -huh. Implying like this is, a, this is a regular occurrence, like you've got a, you've got a protocol for this. Mm -hmm. So they went, up, they went up there and then we, we chatted for a little while longer and then uh, Frank, Frank from your radio show, uh, shows up and he's got, was it rigatoni? He, had a, he made a pasta for you for yeah. Christmas. Yeah. Yeah, he made him feel Parmesan. Yeah, yeah, and apparently he does that for you every year. Every year, yeah. And and so and so I I, I had it I had to leave, so I walked over to the valet and I remembered, oh, I didn't I didn't pay for my drink, so I circled back uh, to go leave some cash on the on the end of the bar, and as I as I as I glance at you guys out of the corner of my eye, you are you have this giant bag and you're removing a golden microphone <laughs> from this bag. Now, Tony. I didn't get the memo that I'm supposed to bring elaborate gifts for you for Christmas. <laughs> I I don't know why. I mean, I don't. I do get a lot of stuff. I mean, I, I get it's it's that table over there is usually uh, when I come back after the first of the year, the table is full. I get I get people send me all kinds of fruit. They send me uh, brisket, turkey. I mean, more food than I can, more food than my housekeeper can eat. So uh, what we we didn't do it this year, but what we usually do is we make these little care packages and um, put brisket and maybe a half an orange, and, and we go down. Uh, there's several places in Houston where the homeless are, and we, we hand it out. Uh, but, yeah, I get Frank, uh, <laughs> he, um, he makes me veal parmesan every year. <laughs> uh, there's certain people in the town that always give me, you know, I've been given custom guns. Uh, you saw that golden microphone. Yeah. Um, it's very gratifying. I mean, I, I, um, I'm not a very good gift giver, but I'm really good at taking gifts. So I'll either bring you frankincense or myrrh next year. <laughs> you already got the gold. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So there's some, there's some iconic Tony Busby stories oh. that uh, I was looking around for. I didn't, I couldn't find them with you narrating the story. You actually telling the story. So I wanted, I wanted to get some stories in your own words. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> the first story was uh, something that came up during the election, and uh, I'll, 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 I'll give sort of an intro to that. Uh, Hurricane Harvey came through, decimated Houston. Mm -hmm. I think there were uh, 80,000 80, some odd structures that were, that were decimated, just completely destroyed. Uh, you hosted the, the fundraiser for the city of Houston on your own dime, and, uh, and that came up during the campaign. Do you want to? You oh, you mean the Snoop Dogg party? Yeah, Snoop Dogg, well, yeah. Yeah. Um, we usually do a yearly party. Uh, we started, we were doing it yearly, then we're doing it uh, every other year. And we're always looking to get a, a, a performer that's, um, you know, somebody that, somebody that's gonna put on a good show. We, we had one year, we had Snoop Dogg. So this, right after the hurricane, um, we decided that, that uh, we're gonna spend this money, why don't we uh, give people, because people were, you know, the good thing about Houston is when these kinds of things happen, people pull together. Uh, and we see this every time something bad happens. 9-11, remember how patriotic and every, everybody That's was right. together after 9-11. Uh, 2008, Hurricane Ike, people came together. Harvey, people came together. Uh, individual people doing heroic things, uh, you know, selfless service out there doing everything uh, they could to help their neighbors. 
uh, even if it's the smallest kind act of just going next door and helping your neighbor rip out their drywall or yeah. things like that. You saw it all over the city of Houston and, and in some cases all over the United States. And so, you know, we people were in a given mood. And so we we made made the party uh, to be, you know, you can don we'd like you to donate money uh, to the, to the Red Cross. Uh, some people criticize that, you know, I, <laughs> I, uh, uh, but it, I love the way that that was used against me in the campaign. Um, but you know, I've gotten grown used to it. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's not a burr under my saddle. It's not even a pee in my mattress anymore, <laughs> but you know, I kind of get, kind of got used to it, but that was a, that was a great party and people were very giving and people continue, people that didn't come to the party gave money. So yes. I was proud of that. Um, but we've always tried to uh, tried to to raise money for certain charities. You know, I'm, animal rescue is something that's very important to me. Um, you know, a lot of the animals we have on on our ranch is our animal res- are rescued uh, from uh, alpacas to you know to uh, camels to uh, I mean just a lot of different animals, horses, donkeys. You know, we started with two donkeys. We liked them so much. Now we're we have almost ten donkeys that yeah. we rescued. Francis loves the donkeys. She loves the donkeys. The donkeys are. I, I never, never knew donkeys were that that sweet. I love donkeys. They're, you know, I I used to make the, you know, the joke about, you know, you look like a jackass today, and then the donkey looks pretty good too. <laughs> <laughs> but I, no, I don't do like that. that. Yeah, I don't want to get in trouble. Um, but yeah, we did that, and um, so that was that was that. So you so the, you have a it's a larger ranch and you have a, a high fence area you call the island. Tell tell us about how that's all laid out. Yeah, we have a I have a ranch that is it's just northeast Texas piney woods, uh, a lot of horses, donkeys, uh, lots of cows. The typical thing you would you would see uh, on a on a ranch: pigs, hogs, um, and then there's this area where we have uh, llamas alpacas there's an area where we have a few goats there's an area where we have some some buffalo uh but there's another the separate area that's that we call busby island which is high fenced and we have uh, every kind of antelope you can think about uh, some critically endangered others just endangered we have camels there we have um gosh every kind of deer you can think of uh, and it's just a nice place to go and you know, you can just go through one of the gates and basically you're doing a kind of a safari. And the ultimate goal was to, uh, was to have a place that's safe that we could bring kids out to and uh, from Houston and let them pet the animals and, and um, that sort of thing. And that's in the work. We hope to be doing that by the end of the year, this year. Great. Uh, but it's going to, you know, a lot of people you know, have zebras, uh, wildebeest, uh, a lot of these animals that people would never see, and uh, you know, you bring bring a five or ten kids from Houston with with a chaperone. You bring them out, let them let them pet the miniature goats and the little pot belly pigs, and uh, let them pet the llamas and alpacas, and let them feed a giraffe and and watch the zebras run. Uh, probably be a very nice experience for a, a child to kind of open their eyes a little bit about what's out there in the world. And certainly. Um, Feed them, feed them a nice meal, and give them a nice bunk, and bring them back. So, so you've done a lot of work with the rescue horses. I've seen, I've seen you have a trainer out there, and, and mm-hmm. you really, really help quite a bit of them. Lots, lots of those rescues can be can be salvaged to even ride. You know, the the uh, Habitat for Horses, which is in Alvin, Texas, uh, is the largest uh, rescue horse rescue organization in the country. Uh, Willie Nelson, I think, uh, res- uh, took a hundred horses from them once. Uh, they have hundreds upon hor- hundreds of horses of people that, that for whatever reason just gave up their horse, um, and so anybody that's uh, you know, and they know which horses are th- you know, can probably be trained and, and and be safe, and they know which ones can't. When we went out there, we chose we chose uh, with one exception. Um, I said, just give us the worst ones you have, the ones that give you the most trouble. Wow, and. Um, you know, I had a horse that somebody had left a, a halter on for when it was a, a baby and just deformed its face. You know, people can be quite cruel with animals. Um, and, you know, we're slowly, those horses are gentle. You can 
pet them, feed them carrots. So they're just, you know, uh, and I think we have 13 or 14 of them now. Uh, and the trainer is, is, uh, has some of them where they're so gentle you can ride them without even a bridle. You can ride them bareback. Wow. Uh, but he spends a lot of time with them. And um, uh, we're even going to rescue tortoises. I saw the call for tortoises go out in the last. She wants. Eight it, she hours. wants. Yeah, a, yeah. She wants to get some tortoises. I've never had a lot of. You know, I'm kind of scared of those things. Right. <laughs> we'll get one. Uh, the black stallion is yours. That's mine. Okay. Okay. Well, That's the horse that I that uh, I have two horses that I ride. I ride him, uh, and then well three really, but but he's the one. But you got to be on your p's and q's when you ride him oh, because yeah. he's he's full of he's full of life and uh, he's big. Yeah. And fast and spirited, and he knows how to do all the prancing stuff and all that stuff. I don't know how to do any of that, but the, <laughs> the horse trainer knows how to do all that stuff. He's the he's the one. Uh, I don't know if you remember the rodeo that I rode in the rodeo. Yes. Yeah. So he's yes. a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful horse. Yeah. Yeah. So um, you also have the you also have the, the story, and probably the first story that people heard about Tony Busby was the tank story. Yeah. Yeah. So my. Um, one of my lawyers who I was my uh, college roommate who we went, went to the Marines together at the same time, he's always, he knows I like to collect things, you know, um, I like, uh, I like historical items, you know, um, anytime there's a, any sort of auction, uh, I've gotten like wine decanters from George Washington or the tobacco box that was on FDR's desk or LBJ's uh, cufflink box, uh, a piece of the Star Spangled Banner, um, you know, sketches done by John F. Kennedy Jr. Uh, or John F. Kennedy, things like that, that, that he's always on the, on the lookout for. Or sometimes you might see it come across, you know, social media or something, and I'll say to him, hey, get that for me. Mm-hmm. See if you can get that. Um, I've been to Normandy twice, and um, my grandfather landed, I think, D plus four at Normandy and, and fought all the way to Berlin. And I have all of his historical things that he brought back, all kinds of Nazi stuff. He pulled off dead Nazi soldiers and, and just all kinds of stuff that, that he, back then, uh, different than now, you could collect war souvenirs and bring them home. Yeah. I mean, he brought home a German Ruger pistol uh, he took off a dead um, a Nazi officer, uh, multiple uh, helmets, uh, stuff you couldn't, you can't do that today. I mean, they, they don't let you bring back anything. No. Um, but so I have a lot of those kind of things. Uh, and I'd been to the, the uh, tank museum uh, that's right outside of Normandy. Um, and they had some private individual had put together just this incredible selection of, of tanks. Um, well, they announced that, that, um, that he was going to retire. The family didn't want to fool with his museum anymore. This was his life work. And David, this lawyer I'm talking, or this uh, colleague of mine, he said, you know, they're auctioning off everything. And I said, really, do you think you'd get me a tank? And I said, it'd be really cool. We could run over cars and, you sure, know, yeah. be out at the ranch. Um, and I didn't think it was going to be that big of a deal. Uh, but when people found, a couple of my friends found out that we were, that I was getting a tank and it took a year to get it. It took a, a, you know, we had to clear customs, uh, in France and then it went to England and then it went to Galveston and then I had to get DOT approval to bring it up the freeway. And I had, uh, police escorts that told me exactly where to put it, which was kind of ironic when then they started ticketing it. They, yes. They're the ones that put it there. <laughs> um, and so we had... You know, it took a year because it was just a bunch of administrative stuff. And so several of my buddies like, what are you going to do with it? I said, I'm having it delivered from Galveston straight to northeast Texas to leave it at my ranch. Oh, no, man, you can't do that. We want to see it. We want to see it. You've never invited us to your ranch. <laughs> we want to, I said, well, I'll park it in my front yard for a week or so. So when we got it to, to my neighborhood, we couldn't get it up the driveway. It was too large, and they were worried that it was going to ruin the, the concrete going up the driveway and then ruin the, the front. And so the police said, well, just put some wood down, and you can leave it right here. And we put up cones, we put reflectors on it, and that's where we left it. Well, it became a huge thing. 
Now this uh, is on the most expensive street in Houston. It became a huge thing. Yeah. Um, you know, it's it wasn't. I mean, people park in that area all the time. The tank is is specifically designed. I mean, the freeways of the United States are designed to for tanks to roll down them because the entire not only is the interstate system a system for uh, transportation, it's also a system for mobilizing uh, war. Okay. So these tanks are specifically designed for uh, the width it's in size to to travel down our roads that's how all of our roads are designed in such in that way ultimately so this thing is not wider than a normal car it's just sitting there on the side you know of course it makes quite an impression when you're driving by and all of a sudden you see a, a world war ii tank sitting there that's fully restored <laughs> yeah um so it created a lot of interest and a lot of people just loved it there were no complaints at all none not one person complained uh, in fact, a lot of people, you know, a lot of the people that I know brought their kids over and took pictures and, you know, they really thought it was kind of cool. And, and I thought not a lot of it. I was, you know, was going to have it moved. And then I got a letter from the HOA, um, which said that, you know, it was a, it was a, uh, it was a uh, hazard because it was causing, it was causing, you know, traffic backup, which is, wasn't the case at all. Uh, and they were afraid somebody would get hurt climbing around on it. And of course, somebody got hurt climbing around on it. it. I have a sign on it that says, "Don't climb around on this." <laughs> you know, uh, but I know people did. But if, if somebody got hurt, it wouldn't be the homeowners association they would look for. It'd be me. Yes. I mean, who would be the bigger target, me or the homeowners exactly. association? Yeah. So that kind of made me mad. And um, you know, and I'm not some big HOA advocate or anti-HOA person, but I called the guy up and I said, "Don't ever send me a letter like this anymore." Don't, I'm throwing it straight in the trash, and if you want to move the tank, you can go out and go call the cops and tow it. Good luck to you. <laughs> and that created a stir. Yes. And so then every two days, there would be a, a ticket on it. Mm -hmm. The cops started ticketing in the tank. And I remember these are the same police officers that told me exactly, that, that gave me the police escort without even asking. Yes. And then stayed there with me while the guy that was that was operating it placed it exactly where they said put it. These that's the same police. Um, so when I started getting tickets, I said, you know, I was I actually had planned on moving it this week, but I'm gonna leave it there two more weeks. <laughs> just just that's just the way I am. Sure. I, I, and some people would say, well, that's a real jerk move, but you know, I it, I did it. Yeah. So yeah. Well, that, that's would part I do it again? I don't know. I mean, maybe I'd have put it on a side street. Yeah. I, I, mean, I don't know, but yeah. you know, um, but but it is what it is. And the tank is. Uh, I did take it out to my ranch. I did run over three cars. Uh, it was incredibly scary. I got <laughs> I got a real understanding of the five people that made up a crew in those tanks, and they are just in there like little sardines. Of course, uh, people back then were smaller. Yeah. You know, my granddad was was 5'8", probably weighed a buck 30, uh, but I, c I couldn't imagine living in one. It's the same tank in that movie um, that Brad Pitt was in, Fury. Yeah, yeah. It's the exact same tank. Uh, and, wow. And they really, in that movie, portrayed exactly how, how cramped it is in there and how they make their whole lives living inside this tank. Um, so we went out and, and ran over a few cars uh, you know, there's no soft spots in there. You know, your head hits. I mean, it's, and so I said, boys, I think we've had our fun with this tank. <laughs> so, so we donated it to, uh, to a museum in College Station, and, and they committed to keeping it operational because it's a lot of work to keep it because it's all metal, you know. Sure. Um, and so they have a fully restored, fully operational with the exception of the main gun tank now, and they've also... Part of the agreement was that they would make it available to the the A and M Corps cadets to the extent that they wanted to use it. So I thought, it, you know, the, the the end of the story is, is good. Yes, yes, yes. Well, that story is about the Texas panache, is what I like to call it. This Texas ethos, like when God decided He's going to make Texas, He's saying, "Why well, can't you just put regular people there? Uh -huh. I got to put, put people there that do what they want to do, like really don't care about the rules." Now the rule followers down deep, but they're a little bit they're cowboys. Let's call them cowboys. Yeah. Well, look, I mean, look, you think it's people like you know, uh, you know. I'm going to Texas, you know. Yeah. You know that. I mean that whole mentality and the mentality of the Alamo and and you know doing things, you know, bold things that some people were, you know, people that are 
that are more he hesitant or or reticent, you know, wouldn't do. Yeah, like I mean, I had a, I've had cases I've been involved in where you know some of my lawyer friends are like, man, are you sure you want to be in that? You sure you want to do that? And you know, you just have to trust your instincts and and um, and go forward. Yeah. So do you do you think it's that you only pick winners or winners only pick you? Like, how do you have such a high, high degree of success in your business? That, that I don't know. I, th I think the law business is one of one of the few businesses that you have a lot of control over your success. You know, in real estate, there's nothing you can do about you know when you hit an economic downturn, or oil prices go down. You know, you may be doing everything right and you're just a victim of circumstance. Yes. In the legal business, you know, I usually any case that I'm personally involved in, I meet the client, I talk to them, I get my sense of them. Uh, I assume all clients lie <laughs> or shade the truth, and I try to spend a lot of time getting to it, getting sure. there, to make myself comfortable. And then in the legal business, you know, the motions I file, the the arguments I make, you know, I have a control over almost. I mean, I, obviously, I can't control the court's decisions, but I. I can make the best pitch and, and hopefully stack the deck in my favor with logic and reasoning and passion. Um, and there's, for somebody like me, there's no better business. Uh, and the margins are good, yeah. you know, um, and I get to choose the people I work with. Definitely. So I, I'm, I'm blessed that I get to choose the people I work with and surround myself with. I get to choose the, the clients I want to work with. Uh, so, so I think, you know, and there may be some cases that I know are tough, tougher than others. Uh, you know, I don't just take the easy ones, um, but I do have the, the, I am lucky enough and fortunate enough and having been doing this a while that I do get sought out by people that have very good cases. Yes. And so my, my advice always to the, to our young lawyers is, uh, you know, why there's, there's gosh, thousands upon thousands of lawyers, uh, in Texas and Houston, there's, there's almost two million lawyers in the United States. Why would somebody choose you? And if you don't have an answer to that, you're probably not in the right business. Yes. You know? yes. And so and I know why people choose me. Uh, so you need to figure out, and you don't have to have the same personality as me. You, can, you, can, you, you, know, you need to have the same work ethic. Uh, but you, you know, I can teach you most everything you need to know. What I can't teach you to be is hungry. And I can't teach you to try to set yourself apart, something you're going to have to figure out, you know, in your professional Sorry. development. Um, so I guess sometimes I choose winners and sometimes winners choose me. <laughs> so probably one of the biggest winners of Texas, Governor Rick Perry, chose you uh, when he was facing, as a sitting governor, facing life in prison, life I in believe, prison. memory serves. 99 years. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I was driving, I was driving to... Uh, pick up my children from um, Camp Longhorn, and I had read about the indictment. I didn't even know that the grand jury had been impaneled. He had hired a different lawyer to manage that. Uh, the advice was, this is silly. There's not, can't be an indictment on something like this. But he, Were you guys friends back then? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And lo and behold, they indicted him. And... Uh, you know, I, I made the, the point, and it's true, that you can indi indict a ham sandwich in Texas because the way it works is, and that's why we both believe there needs to be grand jury reform, is that the only person that gets to talk, you know, of course, the, the defendant's not going to, the charge is not going to talk. Yeah. So you've got a prosecutor in there who can show these grand jury members anything he or she wants and can comment on the evidence and can get an indictment for, for literally any time they want. And the only time you would get a no bill, uh, a no indictment, is when they don't want one. And it clears them, so nobody accuses them of not prosecuting a case that should be prosecuted. So they have 100% ability to get what they want out of that grand jury. So that particular, uh, when, when the criminal complaint was filed by this liberal group out of Austin, several judges, because it went to several judges to impanel a grand jury, recused themselves. So they, they had to go to uh, San Antonio to, to get a judge, and that judge was the one that appointed the special prosecutor because the Austin, or the, the uh, Travis County D District Attorney's Office, completely recused itself. So you had a, a San Antonio district judge um, who appointed his own prosecutor 
And that prosecutor was the one who put the evidence in front of the grand jury and, of course, got the indictment like, like you know, everybody would have known he was. And um, Rick's team at the time didn't put any contrary evidence in front of him, um, including the Constitution that gives him absolute authority to do exactly, absolutely what he did or a video of that DA who was so drunk she was spitting at the police officers, that sort of thing. So recall, she, he was indicted for a line item veto. He basically, this, this specific DA, because she was in Travis County and in Austin, she had, the ability, she had a budget of about seven or eight million where she, that budget was used to investigate any elected official across the state of Texas. It's a very specifically set up by the legislature and it gives her the authority to do that. Well, she was pulled over. Well, she was going the wrong way on, uh, on a road, pulled over with a bottle of vodka, half, half empty, sitting on, the, sitting on her uh, next seat over. She was belligerent. She fought the cops. They had to restrain her. They had to restrain her legs and her arms, and she kept spitting at them. Remember, this is an elected district attorney yes. for Travis County, one of the largest counties in our state, the home of our sitting government. She was spitting at these officers. They had to put a, a spit guard over her. And so when Rick heard about this, he, he said, I don't think she should be investigating anybody. Uh, so he said, I'm going to veto uh, unless she appoints somebody else in her office to, to run that particular division, I'm going to veto. She has no credit. So he didn't even demand a resignation. He just asked her. To no, he just said, appoint somebody else for this because I'm in charge of this is Part of this is, a, you know, you have your own budget, but this seven million, that's my budget. Yeah. And I get to decide how it's spent. So she refused, he vetoed. Um, then he gets indicted. Uh, the conventional wisdom, of course, was once you're accused of a crime, shut your mouth. Uh, so I, I learned about the indictment just on my phone, and I got a call from a block number. And the only person that calls me from a block number is, is Governor Perry. He said, "Could you come to the, Could you come to the uh, the mansion?" It's like, yeah. I mean, I kind of knew what it's about, so I went over there. And he said, "I want you to lead my team. I want you to put together the team, the best in the country." He said, "And you got do it however you think it's right." And I said, "Well, I think you should be on TV tomorrow, because this was a I think they announced it on Friday. Sat, it was public on Saturday, and I think he did his press conference either on Saturday or Sunday. He did a press conference." And we kind of controlled the narrative uh, of pointing out how baseless this was and how it all came about and how it was it's shady and sketchy. And, and we got national figures like, uh, like uh, Dershowitz to chime in. And we put together a, a team of people that had been involved in high profile, uh, Democrat and Republican, who were willing to write op-eds to newspapers. And, and then we pressed the case really hard. And we pressed that judge very hard. He's on the Court of Criminal Appeals now, uh, but we pressed him. Uh, he didn't like the publicity. You know, I went over to the, the special prosecutor who's not, I mean, he's a criminal defense lawyer. That's what he was. I went over to San Antonio to meet with him. I said, man, you're never going to win this case. You can't win this case. Why don't you just drop it now and save, save all of us the trouble? And he thought he had a tiger by the tail. You know, he had a friendly judge. He, he was, you know, obviously, they were friends. He appoint, was appointed by him. And we, we played it out, and we got... Some of the charges, you know, the judge, the sitting judge, and, and I don't have any negative thing to say about him, but it was a hot case, yeah. really hot, and um, he refused to dismiss any of it. Um, then we went to the Court of Appeals. They dismissed all charges but one, and we had to go argue the case in front of the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals, and by that point, the sitting judge was on that same court. <laughs> <laughs> he recused himself. Good. And, uh, and they finally dismissed the charges. But... You know, you got to take that seriously yeah. because, you know, Rick always made this joke about, you know, uh, Travis County and Austin was the blueberry in a, in a red soup or something. I forget his, yeah. his analogy, but, you know, Austin's very liberal yeah. and it's very political. And, you know, that could have went very badly for him. And I think, I think us getting out in front of it, uh, him, him speaking about it, uh, you know, obviously we vetted everything he was going to say, but, but it, it was really a legal issue. I mean, he, it was purely a legal issue. You know, how can you ever indict somebody for doing their official job? That's right. Um, 
but it was an ordeal for him. And, um, you know, luckily, uh, I think because of our work, you know, when people talk about Rick Perry, that's not something they really talk too much about because uh, I think we did a very good job of demonstrating early in the case that it was complete malarkey yeah, and yeah. not to be taken seriously. Well, well, the one thing that you did that, that I think everyone remembers is that day he went to go get his mug shot, and you see that pristine dimple in the He's in a the fine looking man, I gotta say. Yeah, he's a good looking, <laughs> he's good a looking, looking boy. man. Yeah, yeah. No, we, we walked we walked down uh, from the mansion. I mean I made sure, you know, we obviously every detail uh, and, and the press uh, was following around all day that day. Followed us they all were day. all there. We went we went in there and made sure that he smiled in his in his most good looking smile and you know, most mug shots are like, you know, he's just <laughs> looking like he just walked out of GQ magazine. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, he then he came out of the court courthouse, and we had arranged for a large rally. So there were like two or three hundred people there with signs saying "We support you." And yeah, he gave a speech, and that was. And we went and well, got ice cream. We got ice cream. <laughs> that that was the famous part. Of it. That was his. That was that was his little nugget he threw in. Yeah. I said, "What are we going to do now? Are we going to have a drink of Scott?" He says, "No." Let's go have some ice cream. That's right. That's so right. I remember, we were, and you three guys were walking. I forgot the other attorney that was with you, but you were walking out with ice cream cups. Botsford, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah we, we uh, I think we handled that pretty well. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, that's that's part of that Texas swagger, <laughs> right? I mean, like, I don't I don't give a rip. You're indicting me, and I, I'm to take a mugshot. I might spend life in prison. Let's go get some ice cream. Let's go get some ice cream. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, judge, the judge, you know, he was more, he was more uh, hesitant about that. He, he wanted to issue... A gag order, and I was like, "No, sir. Yeah, don't want that. Yeah. We, we're gonna. We need to be able to speak our piece, and you know, we're gonna follow the rules. There are rules that govern lawyers, what they can say. They don't govern clients. Clients say whatever they want. But I was very careful about keeping it. You know, keeping it just like I always am, keeping it within the lines uh, of of the ethical rules, and it worked out for us. And I mean, he should have never had to go through all that. It was very taxing on his family." Uh, he never let it show, uh, but it was, I know it was hard on his family. So for the people that are outside of Texas, you have 95% name recognition in Texas, I'm sure, maybe 99%. But people outside of Texas, who, who's Tony who's Busby? Uh, just a, a farm guy. Just a guy that grew up um, on a little farm, about an acre size, yeah. uh, raising hogs and chickens and ducks and guineas and peacocks and uh, one cow, two Shetland ponies. Um, my dad uh, cut meat for a living. Uh, my mother drove our school bus. And, you know, my, my um, future was either uh, International Paper or Red River Army Depot. Those were the two jobs. Yeah. Those were like the plums. That <laughs> if you could get one of those jobs, you were you were in the money. Um, and uh, just by a twist of fate, was able to go to Texas A&M. None of my parents' had, uh, family had ever been to college. And uh, the rest just kind of just kind of took me on a, a completely different path than than I had anticipated. Sure, sure. So you invited us to to film here at your your it's illustrative more, more offices. More convenient for me. Yeah. This is magnificent. Thank this you. is magnificent. So, for those that are not in Houston or familiar with commercial real estate, we are in the tallest building in downtown Houston, the top floor, uh, magnificent view that you see behind us. Uh, how do you get any better than this? I mean, this is <laughs> this is phenomenal. This is hard to beat. Uh, the the office when people you know when people come in to meet with me, they that these are the things that they expect. You know, they're not coming. Um, they're coming to see me for a reason. Um, you know, we want to have a nice workspace. I mean, people here work incredibly hard, so they want to have, you know, a nice space to work in. Um, and clients want to see that when they come in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think we're going to rename the show instead of interviews or conversations at the mansion. We're going to do conversations at Tony Busby's office. Uh, well, so this is probably the fourth time I've been here in eight months. Really? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Since the pandemic, we've all pretty much worked from home or from remote locations. So. I come in, you know, once every couple of months. Hopefully that will pick back up, but people are still uh, very wary about coming in. A lot of the staff are still um, schooling their children at home. Uh, yeah. A lot of them, you know, if they're not, kids are not going to school. They don't have any, any way to take care of their child care. And as long as the firm is purring along, you know, I'm not really concerned with FaceTime at the office. I'm more concerned with 
uh, work product. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, so, so when I was thinking about who's Tony Busby, I googled it. Who's who's Tony Busby? Oh goodness. This is so this this is what I this is what I realized. Tony Busby is a multi-dimensional leader, exerting influence across business, politics, food, fashion, uh, fashion. justice system, well, and philosophy. Well now. Yes, fashion. yes, yes. Wow. Okay. Everyone knows Tony Busby for, for fashion. Oh, okay. Um, in fact, I was, I was over at um, my favorite clothing store in town, Sid Mashburn, mm-hmm. which is the only men's clothing store in River Oaks, yeah. and the other day, and I said, I said I'm, I'm going to be with Tony Busby. Like, what do I need to wear? They said, well, don't wear anything flashy. The only thing you've got to do is you definitely have to wear a pocket square. <laughs> Yeah, I know. I know some of those people there. Yeah. Um, well, I'm glad to hear that. I mean, yeah. good. Yeah. And, I mean, and it beats my rustler jeans and plastic <laughs> shoes I had growing up. I guess that's right. That's right. And so, so you're one of the the most iconic Texans, and just because you you've executed multidimensionally, uh, I think this past week you were on the front page of ESPN.com every single day. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, New York Times pegged you as quote a big, mean, ambitious, tenacious, fire breathing Texas trial lawyer. Really big period, poster boy big period. I wonder if they were talking about my weight. <laughs> See, I look at everything. I, hear, I, say, I read. I mean, I guess that sounds good in some respects, but I'm looking like, well, maybe I need to get, you know, I need to lay, you know, push back from the table because yeah. you use big three times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, well, I mean, that's flattering. I guess I, um, I. What I like better is is when I hand somebody a large check and and it changes their life dramatically. Yes. Um, I, I like when people who I've never met use my name as a threat <laughs> and I hear about it. I enjoy that. Or I'm going to go get Tony Busby. And, and I like that just having that that kind of, uh, you know, usually when I walk into the court, of course, every judge I'm going to know. and um, But most of the jurors, there's going to be jurors that, that either know me or know of me. And they're going to have, you know, they're going to have read things like that and have their own um, point of view. And they're going to, you know, have their own perceptions of me but I think once we spend some time together they kind of see that you know that these are just things that people write trying to grab clicks and headlines and, and there's a lot more to it than than just those types of things yes yes certainly certainly I think we, we definitely want to get into your compassion your <coughs> philanthropy and, and all the things you've done to help uh, citizens all over the country especially here in Houston uh, so speak, speaking of Houston um, the campaign the campaign huh. Which was the, the epic campaign. So I, th- I think... The Don Quixote of, the, yeah. of Houston politics. So we have something in common. I lost the most expensive congressional campaign in U.S. history. Mm. You lost the most expensive campaign, probably any mayoral campaign in U.S. history, I would imagine. Mm. Yeah, I don't know if I want to be known for that. <laughs> it was what it was. You know, once you get into it and you're fighting, you don't want to stop. That's right. And, you, and you got, you're surrounded with so-called professionals who think they know what they're doing. And yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and they never seen a problem that money couldn't solve. That's right. That's right. That's right. And I think I think these campaigns proved that it it ain't always about money. That's right. That's right. So so getting into the uh, the the race, just the, the general election, you had uh, was eight or nine candidates, mm-hmm. and there was a full full. There was a, a full array. lot of people running. So what was the thinking? What was kind of the decision process that yeah, I want to I want to jump into this thing? Was there any pre polling? Was there any talking to friends? Anything like that? There there was some pre polling. You know, I I noticed um, we we checked name ID as you were referencing. Yeah. Um, you know, I had good name ID. Uh, I guess the misjudgment was uh, we did not know how bad. Trump would poll near the end of the election. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, once once I got connected to Trump, rightly or wrongly, the election was over, and there was nothing we could do to, to come out of that because yeah. Turner had his a lot of weaknesses. Yeah. Uh, he had a record to run on, uh, and, and it was my view it wasn't a very good record, uh, and a lot of things had happened that that you know laid squarely at Turner's feet, but the Trump the Trump um, I couldn't get out from underneath it. Mm-hmm. There was nothing I could do. I wasn't going to come out and and uh, you know, enrage Trump supporters. Yeah. And at the same time, there was nothing I could do for people that, that hated Trump to, to get their vote. So I was just stuck. So whatever, you know, I probably, I don't know how Trump did in the city of Houston versus how I did, but, but I, I, my guess would be it's close to the same. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. I think we'd run some polling the year before that and 36% of conservatives identified themselves not as a libertarian or ultra conservative, they identified themselves as a Trump conservative. Yeah. Bigger than any other any other group. Yeah, and you know, and Turner Turner spent some money, of course, uh, probably spent a lot more than he wanted to spend. Uh, but once he started running the, the 
Trump, I mean, you couldn't look at the TV without seeing a Trump ad that had me yeah. and Trump together. Yeah, it was, it was the bottom of your staircase of your home, wasn't it? Yeah, the yeah. same place that I, I did a fundraiser for Sylvester Turner. <laughs> I mean, it, what was ironic uh, about it was that on that very same stairwell, I stood with Sylvester Turner when I did him a fundraiser in my house. Just like I, I stood with, uh, you know, uh, one of the county commissioners at the same place when he sure. ran for mayor. Uh, there have been a lot of people that have stood right there on those same two yes. steps. Yes. Um, it's just that you know, it, I would, you know, you're, sometimes you're just a victim of how things are at that time, and you know, poli timing and politics is everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at you. You 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 would have been the congressman, but this guy pops up that you're going to interview in a couple of weeks or next week, whenever it is. Dan Crenshaw, yeah. who, who had his own you know, following, and, you know, you got swept up by that. Sure. Um, any other race, you'd have won. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I feel like that that um, had there had been no Trump in the picture, I would have, it would have been very, very competitive and very, very close. Certainly, certainly. Do you think, uh, when you went into the race, I, really you identify four candidates, but probably just you and the mayor. I mean, did, did you just essentially just dismiss the, the rest of the candidates right off the bat, or, or were you? Yeah, I just knew that fun-wise, they couldn't compete with me. Yeah. And, my, you know, of course, I had a – one of the problems I had, obviously, is, you know, you had this persistent Bill King out there. Yeah. Uh, you know, he has been running for office since he <laughs> – you know, he's been running for office, it seems like, every cycle for something. But, you know, he, he had a, some name ID, not, not as much as you might think, but he, he had a, a following of people uh, through his writings and so forth. And, and so I had to, fight, you know, fight him off from – from the right, which Bill King is no, I mean, he's never fancied himself as some right wing conservative. Right. Yeah. Um, and then I had Sylvester Turner on the left. So here I was trying to trying to be right down the middle. And you know, basically, when you're when you're like that, you're gonna you you're gonna make both sides at, mad at you. That's right. It's just That's how right. it is. Uh, right. People are so polarized, and I'm not I'm not you know crying about how polarized people are today. People have been polarized since Abraham Lincoln. Mm -hmm. I mean, we know that. So. Yeah. Um, but it was a tough race, and again, if, if, if there hadn't have been the Trump element, it would have been a lot closer. And you had conservatives in that race that, that once they lost the general, they should have come out and endorsed you to help mm -hmm. you, and they didn't. They didn't. They were just sore losers. That, and I think that they were worried about the Trump moniker. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's, you know, there's a, there's a segment of, and I'm not a Republican. I mean, I was labeled a Republican, but I'm not really a Republican. But there was a, a segment of Republican voters, just like there is now, who wanted to avoid Trump at all costs. Sure. Um, and so those kinds of people, the Bill King kind of Republicans, just, you know, they just stayed home. They didn't have any interest in trying to help me out. Yeah, intellectual elitists. Yeah. That's what we like to call them. Yeah, yeah. well, yeah. that's what they were. Um, I still think, you know, we've always said that there's, there should be another party in this country because it seems like that, that there's elements of both parties that, you know, you simply just don't care for. That's right, and so then you just kind of kind of hold your nose and pick one that's that you're right. closest to. That's right, and you, you got you got the leftists that are using victimization. They're not real victims. They mm -hmm. just they just imply that they're victims and use victim as being victim as a tool. The right embraces the the ideology that we should be victors in life. We overcome our hurdles. We don't mm -hmm. we don't ask for special treatment from our exactly. hurdles. Exactly, and that's the, that's the tough thing. I guess being an independent is is which side do you? It's a hard row to hoe, and you know it takes a uh, when you when you inject Trump into it, it, it makes it even harder. Um, I thought I could I thought I could ride that line. I thought you know that politics, Houston politics, is supposed to be nonpartisan. I took that to heart, uh, but of course it wasn't that. You, sure. know, you had every major so-called national Democratic leader in the country, you know, endorsing Sylvester Turner, coming down here and speaking on his behalf, that sort of thing, and so. Um, and you had the police union, you know, went went his way. Not that I don't know how much sway they really have anymore. I was very flattered to have the fire department uh, yes. working huge. very hard, huge. very working very. I mean, so I'm even today when I'm out and about and I see some an EMT or, or a firefighter, I know every one of them. Yeah. And they wave and honk, which is really gratifying. So they were they were huge, uh, hugely supportive, diehard fans, and probably will always be. Hopefully. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, I ran into one of them that was block walking for you, campaigning for you over at the mansion. We did a political event over there a few weeks ago, or two weeks ago, and he was still talking about you. What, what, what's Tony going to run for next? What's Tony? I said, well, I'll see him a couple weeks and ask him about that. Yeah, yeah. Well, so any, any, any plans in the, in the mix right now? No, nothing. Yeah. I don't yeah. have anything up my sleeve. I'm just going to just 
do my job. Yeah. So, so if I had the opportunity to kind of caption one of your social media posts, my favorite social media post that I saw in all of 2019 was your Instagram post the day after the runoff election. Mm -hmm. You're on your jet <laughs> wearing your, your loafers, your, I think they were blue or, or pastel slacks, and, and you, were, you were heading out. You were heading out, and you said, "You said Houston, we'll, we'll be, we'll be back. We'll be back. Yeah, yeah, yeah." yeah and of course, you get criticized for that too. Yes, because I quote, "Didn't concede, even though I lost, but you know, I only got forty-four <laughs> percent." I mean, I think the writing's on the wall. I don't think I need to quote concede. Yes, it's not like it's going to the Supreme Court for a Bush v. Gore. I mean, that's I, right. I think the election's pretty much over. I think I'm leaving now. Yeah, yeah. Go get a little break. Um, but but if I if I had captioned that picture, I would say that that that's definitely when you some people when they lose, they really win. Yeah, I mean, your your lifestyle would have been much worse than it is now. You think? Oh, it would be horrible. You don't want that job. Oh, you're talking about if had I won. Yeah, you won. You don't oh. want to be mayor, really. Yeah, well, well, you know, I thought I, I, I really, I mean, believe it or not, I'm pretty idealistic, and I, I really thought that I could I could do some real good. Um, you know, I was well, gonna, certainly I was going to do some things that that uh, people would have squawked about. You know, the municipal union is something that needs we need to get under control. That we know we know that the um, we know that the pension issue is still a huge issue with the long-term longevity of the city of Houston. We know that, that we are not uh, performing the city services as professionally as they could be performed, specifically road maintenance and stuff. Uh, we know that, that uh, building bigger highways so people can, can live further and further outside the city is not going to grow the city of Houston. We need to make the, inside the city of Houston safe where people feel like they can have their families here. That's not just, you know, uh, what I call yuppies without children living here in high rises. So there's a lot of things like that that, that, a, that a mayor with help from the private sector could do for the city of Houston had he or she a mind to do it. We just don't have anybody with a mind to do that. Sure. And I, I suspect right now in our current environment, probably the county specifically, I mean, I don't want to say anything about Kim Og, but I'll say something about Kim Og. It's just totally disrespectful to the people of Houston, the, the, the types of bills and bonds that have been, been in place for some of these violent criminals. And it seems like, it seems like there's, there's multiple parties are responsible. You have a legislature who's maybe not acting on certain things mm -hmm. that the counties are doing in other parts of the states. And you also have the federal government who's not, who's not defending the border. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's, it, there's failure on, I mean, look, just look what happened on the power grid. There's, there's failure on every level, uh, private, public, all the way up to the governor. I mean, let's be honest about it. Um, I even say failure in the press. You know, the press press knew that we had issues previously with our power grid. You never saw a story on it. Yeah. Um, so, um, and the same is true with a lot of our local problems with crime in the city of Houston, et cetera. You know, we got the the, the rank and file police officers are completely frustrated. They, I mean, what's the point of arresting somebody? They're being released immediately. That's right. Um, and even violent criminals. And you know, how many stories have we seen where somebody? Uh, who was arrested, bonded out immediately with hardly no bond, and committed a major crime. That's right. It happens all the time in the city of Houston. And all you see, I mean, even with regard to um, uh, this Deshaun Watson issue, which is the only thing I'll say about it, is, you know, I, I know a lot of the people in the police department. I know a particular detective in the police department. I had been talking to him uh, about how do I go about uh, bringing these women forward in a respectful, private way so they can tell their story to, to somebody in the sex crimes division. Um, and we exchanged some texts on that. Well, you know, I, I told in a press conference, I said, I'm informally speaking, and the first thing that the police department did, I mean, how would, why would they ever issue a statement on a case and they wanted to make it clear by Twitter that I had had no contact with the Houston Police Department, which I have the text. You yes. Um, you posted the text. I posted yeah, one, yeah. one of the texts, and the, the detective said, man, you're going to get me in trouble. And I said, they don't know who you are, man. I mean, <laughs> plus I've talked to many people, so don't, you know, my brother-in-law is a Houston police officer. Okay. So, um, so you know, it's that kind of mentality uh, at every level of government, uh, with the exception, uh, you know, I, I think the union leadership for the, for the fire department is doing a good job, but I think... Uh, the Houston Police Department. I'm hoping to see an improvement with the new police chief. Uh, I'm told, you know, that that you know he's from the ranks. He's a good guy, but he's still Sylvester Turner's appointee. Yeah. So uh, we'll see. Uh, but I do believe that that somebody who is willing to go out and engage the the private sector, and there's a lot of people like that who would help if asked uh, if somebody had a plan. That's right. And the problem is you don't really see 
any sort of five-year, ten-year plan for the city of Houston. Um, if there if there is such a thing, you'd certainly never hear about it. I, I would I would venture to guess. I mean, when's the last time you saw a ten-year plan, twenty-year plan for the city of Houston? I, I mean, it's something that most every organization does. I certainly do it here at at, at my law firm. I know we did it uh, at every level uh, at. Uh, when we were on the Board of Regents, you know, every university, uh, individual university has a five, ten-year plan, and the university system had a five, ten-year plan, and we worked very hard to make it, you know, specific, no platitudes, but very specific. Here's what we want to be able to do. Here's what we want, want to lead in, that sort of thing. Here's what's most important to us. I don't see that with the city of Houston. I mean, there may be something on their outdated website. I remember looking at their website. It hadn't been updated since 2017. Wow. Um, so, you know, that's just a lack of, that's, that's somebody, you know, remember Stephen Covey talked about the four quadrants of how you spend your time. And one is important, but not urgent. And one is important, urgent. One is urgent, unimportant, and non-urgent, non-important. You should spend most of your time in the non-urgent, but very important. Yes. That's things like taking care of your mental health, taking care of your physical health, planning for the future, talking to, you know, whether it be at the family level or whether it be at the city level where, you know, what are the things important to us? Where do we want to be going? Because you don't have a, a plan, you know, you, who knows where you're going to go. That's right. That's right. Uh, and, you know, I think Mayor Turner would be, do, do himself well. I know it's an old book. It may be out of style now. It may be uh, maybe it's not in vogue anymore, but, but I would recommend it as reading. I make all my lawyers read it. Uh, and we talk about it quite often. It's like, you know, you're, you, you can break from a, from a micro scale. You can look at it as a lawyer handling cases. What are the things you should be focused on? You should be focused on long-term, non-urgent, but incredibly important things because that's how you advance your career. That's how you advance the case. That's how you advance yourself professionally, physically, emotionally, whatever. Uh, and what I see at the city of Houston is spending a lot of time uh, in urgent, non-important things, and dealing with urgent, important things, i.e., no power in this city, yes. no water in this city, dealing with them uh, in a reactive manner instead of being proactive about and, it. And the night, the night of the big freeze, I think you were out of your house, you were modeling your home, mm -hmm. you were staying downstairs downtown. I think at the Four Seasons at that mm -hmm. time. Uh, you decided to do something really <laughs> unusual. What? what yeah, you yeah. I, you get criticized about everything you do, but you do. <laughs> uh, I we were having dinner, and and uh, I said, man, can you imagine? You know, people are people are without power. Uh, eventually, we'll be without water. And the point was is that you know your home is a place, you know, not only of shelter, but it's where you have water. It's where you have power. It's where you have ability to communicate with others. We're let's be honest, nowadays we, we are absolutely tied to ability to communicate via yes. internet, and, et cetera. And I said, you know, when you don't have any of those things, it's almost like being homeless. And when you're living in a, in a double wide uh, that has no, no real uh, insulation, once you lose power and you have no, no heat, that place gets cold quick. I know that because I've stayed in those before uh, growing up. And um, so I wonder what it's like for people out on the street tonight. And I said, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend the night on the street. And, of course, you know, my fiancé and my, my daughter, like, Dad, don't do that. It's dangerous out there. I said, I can do it. Now it became a, a, a point of personal challenge because yeah. they said, you can't do They're that. They're the ones that say, you were a Marine. You're yeah. going to say, I am a <laughs> yeah, Marine. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. so I did that, and, and uh, you know, it was, it was I could only imagine doing that every single day because you never feel it. You don't feel safe. You know, there's really nowhere you can go without somebody you know, looking, messing with you, and, and you just kind of keep moving. Uh, and so I did that. People said it was a publicity stunt. It really was, and it was just, it was re really more for me. Yes, yes, yes. So talk about the, um, the kind of the backwards thinking that we have here towards growth. You look at the I-10, the, uh, I I-45, kind of the inner loop uh, rework, the $2 billion project that TxDOT's trying to get, get underway. So last week, saw the, I think the county sued TxDOT to prevent mm -hmm. forward progress on the, on the I-45 corridor uh, to get that grown out. I mean, that, that proves your point. They, they, there are certain things they don't want, or, or maybe they're looking for uh, more um, critical race theory-based uh, uh, well, allotments. For I their think Turner, Turner waited. You know, originally Turner was for the I-45 expansion. 
I think he waited and tested the, the political winds to see what, the, what he would consider his voters would look at this. And a lot of people are going to be displaced. There's, you know, one of the concerns, of course, is, is uh, pollution, uh, that sort of thing. And so uh, now, you know, I guess the politically, uh, depending on what party you're with, you know, you, can, you need to be against that. Um, but I go back to this because I, I wish we would spend more time making city, the city of Houston livable instead of making roads wider so we can get further away. I mean, that's, that's the way I look at it. Now, that may not be a popular opinion amongst, in some circles, but, but I, really, I really, you know, and the truth is you're not really gaining a whole lot. We've seen that in other projects where you've widened the roads or added more lanes and you really haven't, you, you really, you really haven't relieved any congestion. Um, you know, one thing that we could easily do that would make things a lot easier in getting around this town is synchronize the lights. I mean, you know, remember uh, Bill White, that was his thing. That's right. Synchronize the lights. Uh, I would challenge anybody to drive around here and tell me if those lights are synchronized. They're not. And, uh, and I'm not just talking about downtown Houston. I'm talking about Richmond, West Alabama, uh, you know, all those, all those arteries, Westheimer, going, going that direction. So, um, you know, I, I just the the lack of the lack of planning is and, and forward thinking is is again they're just dealing with things that are unimportant and urgent. And there's a lot of things that could be done to make this city. You know, he could come out, or any leader could come out and say, "I'm making a commitment to you. I'm gonna. Ma I want to encourage you to come back. I want to encourage you not. Ju and again, I'm not criticizing uh, young professionals. I mean, they're they're. Obviously, uh, I was a young professional once, <laughs> but I'm trying to encourage families. I mean, because the first thing that, that uh, I mean, I, there's a bunch of them that work here that are, that are in their child, child years, having children. The very, the, what, what, is, what, is, what do people, the very first consideration where they're gonna live when they have a kid? What school is the child gonna right. go to? That's the very first thing. You know, I went through all that. You know, the re reason I lived in Friendswood Outside of the city limits of Houston, with it, you know, own municipality, Friendswood has one of the one of the best school systems in the state. There's a reason people are in Katy. There's a reason people are in other outlying areas across the city of Houston. And if, to really make this city vibrant and grow, uh, laying aside you know the oil and gas industry and some of the other industries that that, that we need to support here and and uh, encourage growth here. We got to do something with the school systems. We got to make the, the school districts where people want to live, uh, n not school systems that are s schools that people are just there by default because they have no other option. That's right. That's right. I think that I read a study a couple weeks ago that said that kids that tend to drop out of school are nine times more likely to end up in jail, and <clears throat> will always tend to drop out between their freshman and the summer of their sophomore year because they're just not interested, or they feel the teachers aren't interested in them. Yeah. Yeah. That's a big problem here in Houston. It's, uh, it's a big problem, and that's, and that's you know, I, I used to say it all the time, you know, the, people say, well, the mayor or the, or the county judge can't do anything about the school system. I reject that completely. You absolutely can. You have a bully pulpit. You can talk about it every time you talk. You can, you can, you know, there's a lot of things private industry can do that the mayor has the ability to twist arms to make happen. Yes. Um, but you don't see a lot of that. What you see instead is, well, they're a separate entity with a separate governing body, and we really can't have any control over them. Yeah. I, I, I reject that. Well, and I, I, I spoke to a member of the Texas legislature a couple of weeks ago. He thinks that they're going to be able to take control of the, um, of the Houston ISD uh, before we enter this session. Hmm. So we'll see. We'll see if that happens. And he, and some, someone needs to do something, right? We need to I agree, together. but, you know, I'm, I go back to local control. You know, yeah. I, I really believe in, in you know, you, you, the people that govern the best are the people that are closest to the people they, you know, that they govern. That's right. Uh, right. And you know, I, it's it's objectionable to me just philosophically to have somebody from Austin, or you know, Austin running our local school system. Now, maybe that's what's going to be required because of this current situation, but I, I don't like it. Yeah. What what if they said we're going to come in for 12 months, we're going to reset the board, put some put some governance structure in place, and well, that's and probably what back. they're going to say. I'm assuming. Yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then like the mask will turn into two years, three years. Yeah. So yeah exactly. Let's do two two weeks to stop the yeah. spread. Uh, so you've accrued a lot of. Uh, influence over the past several years. I mean, you, you were already very, very influential before you even ran for office. Well, 
I'm, I'm okay. I'm glad you. I'm, yeah. Okay, I have influence. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. But and it's it's not it's not money. I influence you wearing that um uh, that did, pocket right square. <laughs> All right. I can't get it as high as you do. That's well, the, that's the well, problem. That comes from a lot of years of practice. <laughs> <laughs> so so you you've got this trade off between money and influence. Mm -hmm. I mean, you you have the you know you're you're common man. You went out there and spent the night on the streets with those guys, all the firefighters know who you are. Mm -hmm. uh, you know who they are. You, you've been to a lot of their homes. Uh, you've been to a lot of their funerals and their weddings and so forth. You're a man of influence separate from the, the money, separate from the business success. Uh, what sort of responsibility, thinking about your, your, your business, uh, what sort of responsibility do you feel that's incumbent upon you to, to exercise that, that influence in a, in a way that's uh, that's dignified and it, and it also helps helps others because you, because you were growing up you were growing up in the church mm -hmm. you always heard love your neighbor as yourself and it seems like you're one of the few people that are actually doing that. Well, I just want to make sure I set a good example. Uh, the the uh, your kids learn more about who you are and what you're about and how you conduct yourself than versus what you say. I mean that's just how it is. And my, you know, I've always I've always judged my conduct not not you know what my mother might read in the newspaper, but what my kids may say amongst themselves or think about me. That's really keeps you kind of, kind of keeps you in line. Um, and, you know, my kids are very politically engaged. Uh, they're on all ends of the spectrum. I've got, you know, one of my daughters is incredibly liberal and lives in New York City. And uh, one of my daughters is, is a freshman at Texas A&M. So they're, they're, they're all over the board as far as, as far as their political uh, bent, but one of the things that I'm most proud of is being able to ingrain in them through example uh, kindness, and it's one of those one of those uh, traits that aren't isn't mentioned that much. Um, you know, aggressiveness, tenacity, you know, unwilling to quit, ambitious. Those are all great things, but uh, having a sliver of kindness in there is, yes. is quite helpful and. And they all have that, from my youngest son to my oldest daughter, uh, and I'm very proud of that. And I think the reason they have it is because we, you know, I've tried to lead by example. You know, I, when I, I gave away 13 cars once, I gave those away because my son was, he was having conversations with his buddies, and they were like, what car is your dad going to drive? And I said, son, cars don't, cars don't mean anything. I mean, they're nice to have, and I love cars. Well, I know we'll talk about them, but uh, but what you what you do with, when you have some success, what you're able to do with it is a lot more important. So he was, you know, he was like, I mean, the kid was 13 or something, and he was thinking about, you know, which car. It he was, was Anthony Jr., wasn't Anthony it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which car he was going to inherit and all this kind of stuff. Well, you're not, guess what? You're not inheriting any cars because <laughs> we're going to auction off these cars and give the money to charity. Yeah. Uh, you know, he was shocked. It's just things like that. And um, he know, wanted he wanted the green Lambo it, memory service. Is he, that right? He wanted that car. Yeah, very badly. Um, I'm sure he could picture himself on his first date. <laughs> uh, but it all start that kind of conduct uh, um, started. You know, my dad was is, you know, very big man, very gruff, worked with his hands. Uh, always worked with his hands, very well known in his small community. Uh, one of those kind of guys that, that, you know, he would fight you for any reason and he would make up the reason. Um, we used to just laugh. He'd, he'd fight at the drop of a hat and he'd drop the hat himself. <laughs> uh, and so he was well known. Not, do not mess with Glenn Busby. That's not a guy you want to cross. Yes. Whether it was in a bar room or whether it was just like, you know, Four wheeling in the countryside. I've seen it all. I mean, I've been in the bar rooms with him. I've, I saw him wrestle a bear. I saw him, you know, uh, somebody um, uh, knocked his knocked my brother's snow cone out of his hand, and my dad, you know, made him get out of the car and walked him over and made him buy him another one. I mean, <laughs> not somebody you want to mess with, right? No. So, but he was even with all that bluster and and you know. He, worked on standing on his feet for 43 years cutting meat to, to put food on our table um, he was incredibly kind and so at Thanksgiving and Christmas time he would he would put packages together of turkey and f fresh fruits and so forth and we would go out to some of the most remote areas in Northeast Texas people with no running water uh, no electricity in their house 
and we'd deliver these care packs. He knew these people. And he would make me, and you know, old lady dipping snuff, he's running down her, sitting in her chair, you know, with a shawl over her. Uh, Hug her neck, son. Hug her neck. <laughs> and it made a big impression on yeah. him. Like this guy, you know, is, you know, he was larger than life. You know, I could never imagine, you know, having to fight him or anything. And then you also see him setting an example that, you know, there are people out there that need help, and we have the ability to help them. So we're gonna we're gonna do it. He would, you know, he would we would hunt, of course, uh, every year hunt fish uh, anytime we had extra vegetables from our garden he would always we'd go around and give them to people that he knew could use them and would make use of them and so that kind of that that I'm when I started having kids that's the same um, maybe on a different degree or a different scale but the same kind of trait that I was hoping to ingrain into my into my kids and and I'm happy to say my oldest my, my youngest is 17 I was successful in that regard uh, and so I'm, that's something I'm very, very proud about. Yes, yes. Okay, is this something that wasn't on the car? No, no, that. this is, th we, we've got to talk about something serious now. Okay. This is, this is real deal serious. I know, right. I know we were talking about fluffy subjects like ice cream a second ago. Yeah. Sushi. No. Oh. Sushi. Sushi. In the city of Houston, sushi. Okay, I'll give you the top, well, the top two for sure uh, are MF Sushi is number one. Uchi's number two. Uh, what's this, KA Sushi? I'd never go there. Never no. go there. Never no, go no. there. Um, i trying to think the third place. Who would I go? Where would I go the third place? I'm always going to go with MF if I can get into MF Sushi. Yeah. I think they're doing the best job in this town. Uchi's probably... You know, it, it's done a better job of, uh, of promoting itself. You know, when you think of sushi, you think of Uchi, but MF is better. What's the place that Tillman owns a piece of? Uh, Not Roco Core. No, Roco Core is good. A little different, but good. Um, I, I would put them top, top five. There's one that, uh, who is it? Robert De Niro has a piece of this one. Oh, Nobu. Nobu. Nobu, yeah. I would go to Nobu. Yeah. Um, but my choice would be MF Sushi. Yeah. So, so Nobu started his own chain of restaurants outside of the, the, the De Niro partnership uh, called Ma Matsuhishu, I think. Matsuhishu. There's, there's like 10 or 15 of them. Okay. Well, there's one in Aspen. We were in Aspen last year and popped in there for dinner. Very difficult to get in. Yeah. And there's Nobu right there. He comes over to the table, and he spends 15 minutes with us talking wow. to the kids and yeah. bring, bring us the books, sign, sign the books and everything, talk about sushi. He's like, where are you from? I said, Houston. I said, we have a, he said, we have a location there. I said, yeah, we, we need a couple more. He said, you know what, we're, we're, we're looking at two more locations there. Really? That's what he said. That was a year ago. So It's not, I mean, you, you, I can always get into the places. I'm lucky that way, but, but it's usually packed, even, even in pandemic. Okay. So, so I, I, I agree with you that, um, uh, that Uchi is a top two. I, th I think it's probably, I think it's probably a little bit better than MF Sushi, in my opinion. And here, here's the only reason why. I went. To, I was at MF Sushi last last week for a little bit of due diligence on our conversation. Uh -huh. I'd never been before. Okay. And uh, and, and so uh, get through the meal. Meal meal was, meal was great. Uh, Are you writing that meal off as research? Oh no, I'm invoicing you for it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. And and so I come to dessert and uh, I order the coffee. I'm a Texan boy, so mm -hmm. Japanese. You either have tea or sake with your with your with your sushi, yeah. and then you finish off with maybe a coffee as a Texan boy. Sir, we don't have coffee. It's fine. What do you have for dessert? Bring me the dessert menu. Oh, we only have mochi. Yeah. That's, that's fine. I love mochi. Yeah. Bring, bring the mochi. So they bring the mochi, and they take my, um, my chopsticks. And so I, I wait around for the waiter to come by, and I said, sir, I, I, need some, I need some chopsticks to eat my mochi with. Uh -huh. Well, mochi is finger food. I said, well, it's not finger food anywhere else that I go. I, I said, I'd like to have some chopsticks. I'm not a savage. Uh -huh. that, and that's the, only, that's the only complaint I have about that place. What, they want what, um, what uh, flavor of did you get? Strawberry. Strawberry. Yeah, what, how about you? That's the best one. I mean, they have four flavors, but the strawberry is probably the best you one. You can't go machi. I'm, I, know I, don't even eat the, I don't eat the, the outside cover. I just bit. do like this. And oh, that, no. that, 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 it's so good. It's so good. Yeah, it's good. So that, that's my, that's my, okay. I think, I think Roku, of course, probably top five, like you, like mm -hmm. you said. Um, uh, but, you know, uh, Nobu, and you have Uptown Sushi, too. 
Up to, oh, Uptown's good. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah Uptown's yeah. good. And it's, it's been solid for 20 years, A maybe? long time. They're yeah, good. yeah. Steak, good. steak places, as, as a butcher's son. Ah, oh, steak places. Um, I don't want to give credit where credit's not due, but I do like I do like going to to Mastros and Vic and Anthony's. I like Tillman does steak place as well. He does. He does. He, you know, Vic and Anthony's was a place I would go twice a week when I was when I was eating out a lot uh, by myself. Sometimes I would just walk from here to Vic and Anthony's. I like the bar scene. I like. I just like the food. They cook a really good steak. Mastro's does as well. Um, I like I like B and B just because I like the atmosphere and I like Ben right. Berg. Um, uh, Papa's I'm not a big fan of. Really? I used to be, but the the last couple of times I've been there, it's been a, a not a good experience. Uh, the steak was not good. I, in fact, I sent it back and and uh, paid. You know, they said, well, we're gonna you know comp. I said, I don't really want the comp. I just just tell them that's not a good steak. There's nothing not good about that steak. Yeah. Because it's all about choosing the steak. That's right. Um, what's, what's your cut of choice? T-bone. Okay. I'm always a T-bone. Okay. I, yeah, I'm T-bone. You, you uh, ever grab a tomahawk when you got someone else with you? No. No, that's a little, a little too, too redneck little, for too, you. Too, too, too much for me. Yeah. You know, it's really the what, what I think right now is the coolest restaurant in town? What? Uh, Turner's. That is. They just started opening for lunch, too. That's a cool place. Yeah. Like, if you want to go someplace that, that you feel like you're in New York, the food is, you know, it's basically American stuff, but he's he, he specifically designed it. Behind, it looks kind of like the Polo Lounge yes. in New York. Um, that's, a, that's a nice place, and I think he's he's in the process of opening more. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I, I don't want to leave out Ronnie Killen. Ronnie Killen's his food is different than everybody else's. Uh, he's... He's, I think that guy's a genius, to be honest. Uh, his, and I know we're getting off topic of steaks, but he does steaks, but I don't, I'm not a huge fan of the steaks, but his, his chicken fried steak and his ribs and his brisket, I mean, shoot, man. That guy, that's, he's doing the, the food for my wedding. Oh, really? Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. That'll be great. That'll be yeah. great. So, uh, but we got a lot of options here. I mean, I'm sure there's tons that I haven't even explored. You know, there's places in the Heights uh, that that I need to go visit. I get a lot of people contact me and say you can come visit. You know we got a, a great uh, you know on Bel Air all the various Asian restaurants, uh, crawfish and noodles. I mean there's a bunch of them over yeah. there that are just really good. Uh, we're blessed. I mean yeah. we've got a lot of good food. Yeah, and some of the weird things like like Turner's. I walked into Turner's for a, for a business lunch a couple of weeks ago and I ordered the salad and the soup trying to be responsible. He said, no, you're supposed to get the hot dog. I think it's like a Wagyu hot dog yeah. and the burger. Yeah. I got the burger the next time I came. It was phenomenal. Yeah. And no, he's, he's, he's got it figured out. We, we're lucky. We got, you know, five, ten people in this town who have it, have it figured out, and pretty much everything they open is successful. Vegas versus Manhattan food scenes. I, I hate Vegas, so I'm, okay. I like New York. I mean, it's my place. Okay. Yeah. okay. I can't stand Vegas is. It's just such a shallow place for me. I'm sure that the food is great, and you know that's you know I yeah. don't I don't gamble, so okay. My whole life's a gamble, so <laughs> I, don't, I don't try to make you know I don't want to want any more games of chance. You know, yeah. every every lawsuit I file is a you know at some some degree is a game of chance. That's right. That's right. Uh, fashion. You're fashion. you're you're known for the quint the quintessential Busby look is typically. Some skinny jeans, <laughs> and I don't mean that as an insult. I mean, I mean that they're well tailored jeans. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Uh, either some loafers or some sneakers. Yeah. Uh, a tee. I don't think I've ever seen you in a graphic tee, but then, but then the the great blazer with a massive pocket square there. Yeah. What do you? What What's your kind of vision on 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 style? I mean, are are you are you are you handcrafting everything yourself? You going yeah. to the store and having them put? No, I do. That's all me. Okay. It's whatever I feel like on that day. I like. I buy a lot of shoes. I'm, yeah. I'm real shoe, shoe weirdo. I love shoes. Um, people send me shoes. Really? Yeah. What what size are you? So everyone knows. Uh, Twelve. So people send me shoes, and you know they'll want me to. You know, I, they don't ask me to, but you know, if somebody sends me some shoes, I'll put them on and I'll do a little video for them. And yeah. or they send me t-shirts, and um, you know, I've had tailors in town that offer to to do me one suit for free because you know they want to try to get sure. my business. Um, but you know, in court, I'm I'm Brioni always. Is that, is that a Brioni? Yeah, it's always, beautiful. always Brioni. Um, it's my favorite. And um, and then just for casual, it depends on what I'm going to be doing that day. But you know, I got 
a lot of ja- lot many jackets I've never worn. I like to you know it depends on my mood. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I like to be comfortable. But I, um, you know, there's a new casual nowadays. You know yes. how it is, and uh, uh, you know the lawyers here used to want to do uh, casual Friday. And it's like you, you, what on Friday we're not going to work hard on the cases. We're not going to be <laughs> as professional on Friday. No, we're going to be professional on all days. Um, but yeah, I mean we. Um, I used to get all of my clothes from Toggy. Uh, I've been using Fastari. I like to just buy off the rack. Okay. Um, and um, just whatever catches my eye. Sure, sure. Uh, on the on the shoe front, specifically the, the sneakers, are you a designer sneaker guy, or will you, will you buy, like, the, the old school Adidas and, and things like that? And uh, yeah, I like both. Okay. Yeah, I like both. I walk a lot, so I got, you know, multiple pairs of Nikes. and yeah. Uh, but I like Tom. Tom Ford's my favorite. If it's off the rack, Tom Ford's. I mean, he's the liners are, are just insane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like yeah. Tom Ford. I like his shoes. I like his sunglasses. I yeah. like his jackets. I like his look. The, uh, the like if there was a look that I think is is really a cool look. If you ever watched that show Billions, uh, uh, the man. I've heard about it. Yeah, the man, yeah. you ought to watch. It's a very good show. Um, I'm also a show freak and a and a. Uh, poetry freak and a yes. literature freak so yes. I just can't help myself but I'm interested in a lot of things but the guy the main character on there the way he dresses is kind of is kind of I would say closely fits my my taste okay okay I'll look at that so so the key for everyone when you're wearing white sneakers especially like the Adidas the old school Adidas sneakers with the, with the stripes on them mm-hmm. or, the, or the Nike with the swoosh on it or, e- or even some of these Pumas is if they're if they're if they're primarily white sneakers you wear them Five times, you never wear more than 10 times, you throw them away. I mean, there's a reason why they're like 30, 40, 50 bucks, <laughs> right? You, you got to keep them pristine. Yeah, you got to look good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, um, so I, I want to I close by, by talking a little bit more of a, of a serious uh, uh, subject. So, you know, as the, as the dad of three daughters, um, I just say, I, my wife and I were talking about this the other day. My wife, who, who you know. Of course. About how great it is, is it to have a figure like Tony Busby, just a dangerous figure out there who fights for justice and as the dad of three girls I can just tell you that 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 I'm appreciative and my wife's appreciative for the the defense of victims that that you've uh, espoused over the past really 20 years Mm -hmm. Uh, specifically with you know the the more recent cases where you've got this this kind of tier a predator out there Mm -hmm. who's just taking advantage of of these poor women and, and and using threats of his power against them and I think that I think a lot of that is is having someone like you on the scene that there's a there's a cautionary tale there for them that maybe they can go a little far, but sooner or later they're going to meet their match. And, I hope and, so. And, and I hope you're right about a, that. A general a general rule is you don't mess around with a man that's got a great white shark on his jet. <laughs> you just don't you just don't do that. I hope you're right about that. You just that. don't do that. I mean, if you only knew all of the cases that were quietly settled and resolved with apologies, financial payment and agreement to counseling or that sort of thing that you've never heard of in this town and in uh, across the United States that I get contacted on. Um, a lot of times, you know, it's, it's the absolute not what the victim wants is any sort of publicity. I mean, they've already went through an incredibly, uh, incredibly traumatic situation and then to be called you know, complicit, consensual, and all the other things that they get called just makes it 10 times worse. And so I spend a lot of time, uh, and I'll just give you an example, um, Stanley Marsh, uh, the creator of the Cadillac Ranch in Amarillo, who's now deceased. You know, I got a call from a lawyer from Amarillo. He said, I have this uh, 16-year-old boy he says that Stanley Marsh has been paying him for sexual uh, conduct to perform for him, various things, giving him Viagra, uh, help encouraging him to, to recruit other young boys. Now, I knew who Stanley Marsh was. I'd been to the Cadillac Ranch. I knew that he was one of these guys in Amarillo, a big guy uh, in a small city, uh, financially powerful. Wife was on every board in Amarillo, country club, et cetera. Uh, but I wasn't a member. I wasn't from Amarillo. Yeah. I really didn't care about Amarillo Social Society. I, st- I said, I'm going to send a plane to get you and bring him over here and let me hear it from his own mouth. 
so he came a lawyer came over with a young man and with his mother and I had the I told them just go wait in there I'm gonna talk to this boy alone and so he told me his story and I had him draw for me it's Marsh's office show me exactly where Marsh's desk was everything I was testing him. Uh, almost knocked me out of my chair some of the things he told me he had pictures he told me about all the other boys that were involved, how he felt guilty because he had, he had told him, Marsh will give you 20 bucks or 30 bucks or Marsh will give you some, you know, this drug or that drug if you will come up to the 12th floor of Chase Tower in Amarillo. So I started filing cases. Uh, I filed one, then the next day I'd file another one, and it was big news in Amarillo. And I knew I was right, though. And I knew, despite and the, you, the, the vitriol, from that community against these boys, you know, uh, partly because, uh, you know, they were doing, ac involved in activities that, uh, that people thought were homosexual activities and were, you know, just all, every, you can only imagine the kind of comments they made to the, about these boys and about the boys' families. Um, because they were most, for the most part, all minors, so I had to file the cases, I had to list the, the mother or father's name and put as next friend of Jane Doe or, or John Doe. And the, the vitriol against these families, uh, because you're attacking, you know, an a iconic legend, Stanley Marsh, who's done more for this community than, than these boys ever done, other than, you know. You know. And so every couple of days, I filed another case. Every couple of days, I filed another case. I put together a package, affidavits from these young men, pictures, drawings took it to the, the Potter County DA, which is Amarillo, and he recused himself. Uh, and they brought in the DA from Lubbock, who indicted him for under 12 counts of, of misconduct, sexual abuse of children, et cetera. Uh, and then all of a sudden, all these naysayers who had been saying all these things about these boys, now all of a sudden, they turned on Stanley Marsh. Uh, and Stanley Marsh, uh, never didn't live to be prosecuted he died probably six months later which uh, is just a shame yeah just a shame because I you know, my thing was I, he should be put under the jail for what he's done to these boys um, so I've been through this before and I and I would like to think that that you know when people hear about this case or that case that th there's there's method to what I'm doing and I'm doing it in a methodical reasonable way and maybe it's not the way they would do it but maybe I might know a little bit more than them about how to do things that work. Um, and so I'm proud of that. I'm proud of, you know, uh, some of the cases, you know, I, the list has grown so much that, you know, cases that I'm really proud about, but I'm proud of that one uh, because Stanley Marsh uh, was a predator. And, uh, but there, there, there are predators out there. Um, like I say, I, I, I can never disclose it, but there are people that you know uh, people in high places that I've handled cases where people have alleged certain things against them, uh, and we handled it in a way that was that was satisfactory to the victim. Uh, I always try to make include an apology uh, and then a commitment to work on themselves so it doesn't happen again. Um, <clears throat> and the truth is, this latest this latest case would have been resolved in the same way, but there was no willingness to do so on the other side. So I think just, just, just as, we, as we wrap up, um, Jordan Peterson likes to talk about something you just alluded to is uh, one of the purposes of the justice system is to obtain apology, to obtain repentance, or at least have some sort of turnaround of the, of the, um, uh, the, the perpetrator. Uh, you obviously, you want to have some sort of restitution emotionally mm -hmm. uh, or physically from the, uh, with, with the victim. But I think a big part of that is, again, as a dad of three girls, you've got four kids. You know, if someone offends those girls in a certain way, you know, it's not for me. I don't want to wait for a justice system. Mm -hmm. I want to have vengeance. I know. I'm going to go tear someone's throat out. And Jordan Peterson talks about, like, that's one of the purposes of the justice system is that it relieves the family of the accusers, the family of the victims from trying to seek out vengeance mm -hmm. and revenge on themselves. And it seems like having someone like you, not, not even if they're represented by you, but having someone like you hanging out here overseeing and just it's, there's a potential that you could be brought in on some of these cases that that alone provides that sort of relief for the the victim's families that there's the chance that someone like Tony Busby or Tony Busby himself God forbid hmm. 
to interject himself in a situation. I hope you're and, right. And apply ultimate vengeance. I hope you're correct in that. I mean, if, I, if that's the case, then I'm, I'm doing my job. Yes, yes. Well, Tony, I appreciate your friendship. Appreciate everything you've meant for this community. Thank you. The community loves you. And, uh, you <laughs> well, some of it does. Yes, yes. And we're waiting to see what, what's next from Tony Busby. All right. Thanks, Thank my friend. You. Yep.